Um, this is a very much a work in progress, uh, as you'll see. And a large part of the work uh, is the PhD thesis work of Anas Christensen. Uh, so I want to acknowledge him right away. But, but this is a hard problem, so a lot of other people uh, have contributed to this. Uh, we, have, we have some uh, publications in this area, but as you'll see, everything is, is pretty much in a, in a state of flux. This is a, this is a hard problem. Uh, so what I want to talk to you about is protein structure determination using information, the information that we get from NMR. Um, so this is really painting with a, a broad brush here, but um, one thing that should be hopefully of interest to this audience, uh, and which I realized only relatively recently, is that uh, when it comes to NMR protein structures, you're really talking about a computational model uh, with, a few, with some restraints from experiment. But it's really a computational problem, and I think a lot of, I think computational chemistry can really contribute a lot more to this. Uh, so anyway, the, the most protein structures still come from X-ray. Uh, and relatively few come from NMR. So, so why is that? Um, well, there are some, some technical problems uh, with getting these constraints, these distance constraints, uh, as you go to larger systems. And so fewer constraints means less believable structures. Uh, but that's only if you believe that uh, other terms, like the force field description uh, of protein structure is inadequate. So I think if the, the, the way forward for NMR is really to supplement or complement the protein structure determination problem with, with better force fields and, and better um, and other information experimentally where quantum chemistry or theoretical chemistry will sort of act as the bridge. Uh, yes. So the take home message here though is that this is really a, a modeling problem even if you're talking about an NMR structure. Uh, so one thing, um, so that's one revelation, is that the, the, NMR chemical uh, the NMR structures are really model structures with distance constraints. But there's actually, when you do these distance constraints or get them, there's a lot of other information that you throw away. And one, one are chemical shifts. So you'll get the chemical shifts as a byproduct of, of your distance constraints. So why not use the chemical shifts? Uh, and the main reason is that it's, it's complicated. Uh, the connection between the chemical shifts and the protein structure is a complicated function. And again, here I think uh, theoretical chemistry can help. There are some empirical chemical shift predictors. So structure in, chemical shifts out. Uh, but these, as I'll show you, they're made for different purposes. They're not really made for determining NMR structures. And that leads to some problems. Uh, the other problem with go moving from distance constraints to using chemical shifts and force fields is that if you have fewer distance constraints, then your sampling problem is larger. Right? So these distance constraints really confine the conformational space that you have to search. So a normal NMR structure will have so many constraints that you can basically fold the protein overnight. Uh, as you get fewer of these constraints, the sampling problem becomes larger, and so you also have to address that. Again, that's a computational problem. Now, this is not to say that no one is, is working in this field. There's, there's a few groups, notably uh, David Baker's group and Vendroscola's group, uh, and, a, and a few other people who are working on this, on this very hard problem. So it's not that we're not, that we're not doing anything. Uh, so, for example, David Baker, who knows a lot about protein folding, uh, is looking at using the chemical shifts to guide the sampling. So if you know how the structure determines the chemical shift, if, then you perhaps can turn that problem around and, and try to find out from the chemical shifts what structures are most appropriate. So in a, in a way, it's, it's trying to use the chemical shifts to help with the sampling problem. Uh, so that's one way to use chemical shifts. Another uh, use of chemical shifts is to use it as an extra energy term. Uh, so basically you're looking for, you're building into your energy function a way of optimizing the agreement between the computed chemical shifts from your structure and the experimentally measured chemical shifts. So that's, that's two ways of, of using chemical shifts. 
in protein structure determination. So here is a description of the, of the last idea. Uh, so this is uh, a, a very nice figure made by, uh, from a paper by uh, Jorge Villa and mm -hmm. Harold Shiraga. So the idea is, is very simple, right? It's, it's basically protein structure validation in a sense. Uh, you have two possible protein structure structures. You compute the chemical shifts for both, and then you compare it to experiment, right? And the structure that gives you the best correlation is probably the right structure. So that's what I mean by, by using the chemical shifts as kind of a force field term, right? So normally you look for lower energy. Here you look for a lower error, a better agreement with the experimentally observed chemical shifts. So the idea is very simple. In practice, this is a, a little more complicated. Uh, so you need, let me go back here, you need a program that can, from this protein structure, give you the chemical shifts. And this needs to happen relatively quickly, uh, and it needs to happen for relatively large systems. As I, as I mentioned before, there are methods that do this. There's quite a few. Uh, and they're all empirical in the sense that there are most of the method comes basically from taking experimental NMR data, experimental X-ray structures, and then optimizing a method that gives you chemical shifts. Um, these methods are basically made with one goal in mind. Right? You take a X-ray structure, and you're then given chemical shifts that matches the experiment as well as possible. Uh, so if that is your goal, right, then the best method is going to be one that's fairly insensitive to the protein structure, so that anything you throw at it right, will give you reasonably good chemical shifts. Uh, and so here is an example from a paper that describes one such method. Uh, and actually, they're, they're very proud of this figure. And it, it is really an uh, amazing accomplishment. Right? What it shows is, here's the right protein structure. Uh, and this protein structure gives you very good chemical shifts as measured by the correlation coefficient. Right? But as you give it increasingly worse protein structures, right, the agreement with experiment doesn't really change very much. You still get good chemical shifts. Right? It's only when things get really, really bad that you get a, a bad correlation coefficient. So this is great if you have a so-so structure, a low-resolution structure, and you want a good prediction of chemical shifts. Right? But it's not good for this, where you want to distinguish, you want to say this structure is incorrect and this structure is correct from your chemical shifts. Right? Then this, this is not what you want. You want something that's very sensitive to, to the structures. So another way of demonstrating this is uh, here. So we took a small protein. Uh, we used the X-ray structures, and then we used uh, ab initial calculations to predict the chemical shifts. So it's, it's just for one of these, one of these chains. So that's small enough that you can throw it in, in, in a computer program and get the chemical shifts. And this is at a reasonably good level. So we can, if you uh, look at similar calculations on small organic molecules, you get very good agreement with experiment. Okay, so here are some, here is the method I showed you before on the previous slide. Here are some other chemical shift prediction methods uh, that are empirical, right? And as you can see, you do not get very good agreement with the empirically predicted chemical shifts and the, the DFT chemical shifts. And so the reason is that they're insensitive. As you can see, the range of chemical shifts predicted, right? is much smaller than the range of chemical shifts predicted quantum mechanically. And the reason is that chemical shifts are very sensitive to the protein structure. Okay? So that is reflected, that is reflected by the DFT calculations. Okay? But that also means that, also means that it's uh, very sensitive to small errors in the protein structure. Right? So in order to get a good agreement, with experiment from structures that have small errors in them, you need, you need to remove the sensitivity. Okay, and that's bad. So uh, one thing we did was to develop a chemical shift predictor that is based on ab initial calculations. Uh, and we call that Proceus. And this is for 
a special kind of nucleus. This is for the amide uh, proton chemical shift. Uh, and as you can see here, you get a reasonable, reasonable, well, certainly a much better agreement with the DFT calculation. So this is based on DFT calculation. So basically what this is, all this is saying is that the assumptions we make in order to develop a fast method based on DFT calculations on small fragments, these assumptions work reasonably well when you compare it to the, to the real thing. Okay. So the bottom line here is that you can get uh, DFT, you can get chemical shift predictions at this, roughly this kind of level, uh, from a, a very fast method. Okay. The problem is if you, if you then take this method and take an X-ray structure and compute the chemical shifts and compare it to experiment, uh, right, you, get, you get very bad results. Right? So if you compare it to DFT, you get very good results, right? much better than the other methods. If you compare it instead to chemical shifts from experiment, you get bad results. Right? High RMSD and low correlation coefficient. But that is if you use the X-ray structure. Right? So again, the problem here is, is that the X-ray structure has small errors in it. And these small errors, if you do the prediction right, are translated to errors in the chemical shifts. And it's these errors that we want to remove or identify, at least. Okay. And I think this is part of the reason why there's very few methods out there that are quantum-based for protein chemical shift predictions. Because if you develop such a method, and it takes a long time, right, and then you start to apply it using X-ray structures, you're much worse than the empirical methods, right? And that's, that's hard to sell, okay? But it should be worse, and you, you can use this error. So what you have to do then is you have to find, you have to minimize this error by changing the structure. So basically, you can think of it as, as geometry optimizing the structure in order, and in order to increase the agreement with the experimentally measured chemical shifts. Uh, and so we use a Markov Chain, Mon a Markov Chain Monte Carlo program uh, implemented in a program called Feistas, and we use a hybrid energy function. So we don't just use chemical shifts, we also use a force field, in this case, OPLS AA. So it's, it's both a force field and a, and a chemical shift in there. And as you can see, the, the agreement, the, the RMSD dropped, not a lot. Um, oh, this is for different proteins. So, so the agreement is now better overall. It's better than the chemical shifts predictions um, based on X-ray structures and ensembles. So this is an average over many structures based on the OPLS form, force field. Uh, it's still not better than if you use an empirical method to predict the chemical shifts. But this, this number here hides, hides a lot of different, or represents a lot of different amide protons. If you just look at this scenario, which is the most, probably the most important set of amide protons, the ones that make hydrogen bonds to other backbone uh, groups in the alpha helices and the beta sheet, then the RMSD is down to 0.3 ppm. Okay, so you do get very good chemical shifts from ab initio based or quantum based chemical shift predictors if you use the right structures. Okay? You can turn it around and say you can use these ab initio based chemical shift predictors to get very accurate structures. Now are these very accurate structures? All we've done is minimize the uh, or maximize the agreement with computed and predicted chemical shifts. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the structure is also uh, better. So what you're looking at here is the average hydrogen bond length for amide proton, involving amide proton chemical shifts. Uh, so let's take ubiquitin, for example. Uh, so this line here, that's the experimental average from the X-ray structure. And this is the distribution of hydrogen bond lengths from an ensemble generated using a force field and process and the chemical shifts, the amide protons chemical shifts. 
right? As you can see, you get a tight distribution around the experimental value with a maximum very close to the experimental value. Okay, so we haven't done much to the structure compared to X-ray, which is a, uh, this is a very pretty good X-ray structure, right? But these small things that we did had a big effect on the chemical shifts. If you do, if you generate an ensemble just based on the OPLS force field, right? And as you can see, you make the agreement in hydrogen bond lengths between experiment, which is this line, and the ensemble worse. Right? So, in other words, adding the chemical shift information on top of the OPLS force field makes the hydrogen bond geometries better. If you use an empirical method, like camp shift, you make them a little bit worse. Actually, it doesn't help things. It actually makes things a little bit worse. Now, there are question marks here because two days ago we discovered that these two runs had a slight error in it. So it's possible that these two will get better, will get closer to the experimental value. That's why there are question marks there. But this, at least this result is right. My guess is that these two histograms will look a bit more like that. And the reason is that the chemical shifts from cam shift are very insensitive to the structure. So they actually don't, they don't really do much. They don't affect the ensemble very much. Right? Whereas chemical shifts from quantum-derived methods do a lot better. Okay, so this was, this was amide proton chemical shifts. So the, this is just one kind of nucleus in the protein. Uh, there are many other nuclei, as you can see, and they report on different things. Amide protons report mainly on the hydrogen bond length here. Uh, so here are... Here's another hydrogen in the backbone, the, the hydrogen next to the alpha carbon, and the nitrogen in the amide group. And so the comparison is, is the same here, right? So quantum mechanically uh, computed chemical shifts for a small protein on the y-axis and empirical chemical shift predictions, in this case from camp shift uh, here. And as you can see, again, the agreement is probably a little bit better than amide protons, but you definitely have some, some outliers. You should also know that, note that the scale here is, is quite a bit smaller, uh, bigger. So in, in other words, outliers have a larger error than on the previous plots, and especially for the heavier atoms, right? You're looking at, at, at errors here larger than 5 ppm, so, so pretty big errors. So we're in the process now of doing ab initio calculations in order to develop or extend the proceeds method in such a way that it can predict not just amide proton chemical shifts but other chemical shifts. Now, this is a big job. Uh, we're almost done and I estimate that we've run probably a hundred, uh, a million ab initio calculations, right? So basically what you have to do is figure out the conformational dependency of the chemical shift of all these kinds of, of functional groups. So it's a big job. Uh, we're almost there, but we're not there yet. We, we don't have it, so I can't show you how to use this in protein structure determination. What I can show you is the, is the next best thing. So we've used camp shift, which has, which has been parameterized for all the, the nuclei. So this is, how, this is an example of how we want to use this, how we want to use ProCS when it's done. But it's, it's already working pretty well uh, with camp shift. So it's a lot of data here. This is data that I got last night, so it's, it's really hot off the press. So what we're doing is we're starting from an ex extended structure, and we want to fold the protein. We have ubiquitin and, and another small protein here. Um, <coughs> then, so what we're using is camp shift, chemical shift predictions. Uh, we're using some NOE. This is synthetic NOE data, so we're using a few distance restraints, uh, mainly involving nuclei in the backbone, and we're using a very simplified coarse grain, well, not coarse grain, but simplified force field, called Profasi. Uh, and the reason we're using this instead of OPLSAA is that we have to, you, we have to calculate the energy uh, a lot, uh, many times. So this is a Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation again, uh, and each thread here is a different run. It's a, it's a different run of 40 million 
uh, steps in a Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, this is the energy that includes chemical shift data and NOE data. And this is the RMS relative to the experimental X-ray structure. Right? And as you can see, you have to do this a lot. Most of the times, most of the simulations don't converge. They don't find the X-ray structure or anything close to it. Right? So it's just, there's a big sampling problem issue. Right? So, um, but every once in a while, we're lucky, like here from the blue thread, right? and it actually finds the right answer. The red here is a simulation started from the X-ray structure. So there's really no sampling issue here. And it's just testing how well the force field is able to describe the structure. So the red here is the best we can do. Right? And so in this particular case, we find the lowest energy here is uh, about one angstrom, has a one angstrom RMSD with the right structure. Here, the lowest energy here has about a four uh, angstrom RMSD. Right? So here, we're, the, the prediction is pretty off. And it's not because of the sampling issue. Right? Here, when we sample starting from the X-ray structure, we get a higher energy. So this is a, this is a force field, or in general, a, a, a force field problem, probably due to the fact that either the force field itself or the cam shift predicted chemical shifts are not accurate enough, are not sensitive enough to the right structure. Right? So we hope that this will improve when we use quantum-derived uh, chemical shift predictors. Right? But the idea is, is really that with chemical shifts and a few distance constraints, uh, we are able to fold small proteins. Uh, and the additional experimental information, both the NOEs and the, the chemical shifts, make up for deficiencies in the force fields we have to use. Uh, and the force fields are of not state of the art. And the main reason is that, well, they have to be very fast so we can afford to sample many, many times. Right? And we do have to sample many, many, many millions of times. Okay. So that's, that's where we're at right now. Uh, we hope that when we, use, when we get ProCS working for the other nuclei, that, uh, um, that the energy function will be good enough so that the lowest, the best protein structure has the lowest energy. And it looks like, at least for these small proteins, the NMR data guides the sampling well enough that for many, not always, but in many cases, we're able to sample well enough to find the structure starting from an ex extended. Okay. So a summary and outlook. So chemical shifts, including chemical shifts, might lead to better protein structures and hopefully bigger protein structures. By bigger, I mean that, well, when you go bigger, you have fewer distance constraints. Maybe the chemical shifts can make up for this and provide additional information additional constraints that enable you to find the right structure. Uh, but in order to do this, you, you really need chemical shift predictors that are based on quantum mechanical calculations so that you remove this error that's built in from errors in the X-ray structure when you parameterize your method. Uh, sampling is still an issue. Uh, there's a question mark here because in the previous slide, right, we're able to sample well enough at least once. Okay, but these are small proteins. These are less than 100 amino acids. Right? And the sampling issue does not scale well with size. So this is still an issue. Um, now, in order for this to be a practical method, you need to remove another bottleneck, a practical bottleneck in this, and that is the assignment. So you have to figure out which chemical shift that you measure belongs to which nucleus. Uh, and there are some automated methods out there, but in general, most NMR structures are still done by hand in the sense that the assignment is done, if not fully uh, by a person, then at least partially by a person. So there's a big time investment and a big source of error uh, here. So I have another student, Lars Breitholm, who's, who's working on, on this. So including the assignment problem in the Monte Carlo simulation. 
And once we get to really large proteins, uh, I don't think NOEs and, and chemical shifts will be enough. Uh, so we also need to include other data, uh, so circular dichroism data and small ankle X-ray scattering data, maybe hydrogen deuterium exchange and things like that. But I think, again, we'll be faced with exactly the same problem. Right? We need fast methods that can predict these things very quickly. And I think these methods need to come from quantum mechanical methods where you remove the, the errors that are that is in the empirical data. Okay, so there's some I think some really big challenges to, to folks out here. Finally, uh, we're starting to reach a point with some of these methods uh, that we can start to ask the question, well, can can we we can minimize some of these proteins. We can energy minimize these proteins using quantum methods or quantum based methods. Are these are these giving us good structures? Right? With the NMR chemical shifts, we now have a tool to validate these methods to say whether or not you get an improvement from optimizing with these methods compared to, for example, uh, empirical force fields. So I think this is, a, this is an open-ended question. Uh, but I think it's, it's one that, that we have a chance to answer now. OK, so that's all I have to say. Um, there's a little advertisement here. For those of you who don't know computational chemistry highlights. So while you look at that, I'll be happy to, to answer any questions. Yes, so it's, yes, in fact, some of the Monte Carlo uh, runs we're doing is similar to annealing, but we changed the structure. Now, the reason we use, well, one of the reasons we use Monte Carlo is that we don't, we don't have gradient terms for any of these, so an MD simulated annealing would, would be difficult. You'd have to reformulate uh, the method, but in principle, yes. Uh, in terms of problems, of, yeah, but what kind of problems? Uh, well, uh, the PCM model does uh, have difficulty in describing the solvent effect, right? If you have problem uh, bridges or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yes. So a, a, you try an explicit model. Yes. In fact, that's when you look at the uncertainty uh, in the or the RMSD, for example, between what we pre uh, predict and experiment. Most of that error comes from solvent-exposed amide protons. And right now, we have a, a really bad method for that. Uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a big problem. We have problems with the side chain conformation. Our experience has been that anything in the neighborhood of a triptophane or phenylalanine is because you don't often don't know exactly the orientation and that for proton chemical shift in particular. Yeah. It's really, I mean, we had a ton of unpublished stuff of the diapotoxin and so and anything which is any distance from an element is side chain where we are not sure of the, of the exact conformation, it's just disaster. Yeah, so that's why I show, when I showed hydrogen bonds, for example, I show a, a distribution. So you simply have to generate from, with the Monte Carlo, a distribution of conformations, including side chain conformations, and take an average. So, yeah, it's, and it's a lot of, it's an average over a lot of conformations. Is there any specific reason to use BT and YT? No. It, we just did, um, there was, I think we used it because there was a, a set of papers for small organic molecules where they had developed a scaling factor that, that brought you very close to experiment. So basically it was 
in this particular case, for amide protons, right? We just have found a good benchmark, and then we use that. For, I think for other nuclei, we'll, uh, we're using other functionals. Is the noise that uh, are the diffuse function? There is, but not on amide protons. So, so, the, so the B3LYP triple theta, that's just for amide protons. I'm not saying we're using that for all the other nuclei. So you are concluding triple theta, this is saying it's equivalent Yes. I mean, we've, we've done careful calibration tests uh, comparing to couple cluster for small systems, and there's a scaling factor in there that makes up for the la last bit of, of difference. Thank you. Um, 